Good morning, and um, I'm very honored to be here in Ottawa today and thank the ACC for organizing uh, this event. Um, I work in NATO headquarters, and therefore my presentation this morning on the issue of Afghanistan will be very much from an overview point of view. I will not talk about uh, development per se, but I will talk about the triad that is necessary to make things move forward in this country, the triad being of security and development and governance, the triad which has been stressed since the Bonn Conference in 2001 and in subsequent international conferences both in Bonn and Tokyo. Uh, we have other very distinguished colleagues on the panel who know more about development issues in Afghanistan than I, so my talk will be a little bit broader and will encompass these triad issues. First, let me pay tribute, as has been done earlier, by um, the introductory comments to the military who have forged a way forward in Afghanistan, and that will be one of my main themes. Uh, there can be no development nor can there be any prospect of longer-term good governance without a stable situation. And it is very much the military who have been front and foremost in creating the prospects for development in that very difficult, impoverished country. What has been the NATO goal? The NATO goal in Afghanistan has been stated by so many people in so many different conferences that one loses sight of the pithiness of this, of the, the essence of why we are there. And I will try to boil this down based on a number of recent speeches by the Secretary General of NATO. We were there, and we are there, to prevent this country from ever being used as a safe haven for terrorism. That is why we are in Afghanistan, and that is the basis for any measurement, for any metrics that will be applied to the progress in Afghanistan. This was not a good feeling development initiative in 2001. This was not an idealistic, let's put in place good governance in a third world country in 2001. This was very much about stability and security and ensuring that over the longer haul this country would not be diminished by activities of terrorists on its soil. I will be brief but I would like to take a big step back and for those of you who are at an ACC event for the very first time uh, show a slide because I will be talking a little bit about NATO partners and I wanted to make sure that the ground rules for this were set. Um, there are currently 28 NATO allies, the green, most of them who have joined now since the initial grouping of 1949, and a very broad group of orange colors, which I will refer to as partners, who have played a key role in Afghanistan. There are now 50 countries contributing to an international community effort, and many of those orange countries, some of them aspirants to become members of NATO, some of them who will never wish to become members of the NATO. Then across the top of Africa, Mediterranean dialogue countries, some of who have played a very key role in Afghanistan, and then running southeast along the Gulf, countries who both in Libya as well as in Afghanistan have played a very key role. My presentation will not have a lot of slides, so I will spare you a lot of flipping through pictures, but I would like to talk about the following issues. This has been a collective effort over the last 12 years, and from speaking with my distinguished panel uh, colleagues this morning, there will be some who will wish to criticize this collective effort, and that's very legitimate that we hear those voices of criticism, because there is a lot of criticism to go around, and I think it's important to understand where we have failed. That's part of the lessons learned. We want to align our international assistance to Afghan priorities, something which we have taken a great deal of time to do over the last several years. 
we came in, boots on the ground, knew where we were going, and it was our priorities that dictated the pace in Kabul. This has changed now over the last several years. I'm very pleased to be able to talk about that in a few minutes. We need to continue to commit our resources to this country. We will cease all combat role in Afghanistan by the end of 2014. In fact, most of our combat role will cease the middle of next year. But, and you will have followed this from the Chicago summit, we are in Afghanistan for the long haul. We will have mentoring, training teams there well into the year 2020 and beyond. This is a very long-term perspective. We have strengthened the Afghan National Security Forces, working with very courageous young men and women who for the first time are taking seriously issues which we in Canada have taken for granted. Due process, law enforcement, treatment of individuals in a respected way. These are new ideas in Afghanistan and there's been a lot of very good work done in police sector reform as well as working with the military. We are engaged with communities. Some of the other panel speakers will speak to this more than I and we are very much in this because we support a regional dimension solution both for Afghanistan and Pakistan. This year represents the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So my short few words are going to be compared. What did we know in 1962 at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis? And how have we learned the lessons from Afghanistan in dealing with future crises? Because I believe that if we cannot look back and put our finger on what it is we've learned, then we will have done all of this for nothing. 27 October 1962, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Robert Kennedy was dispatched to meet with the USSR ambassador for a, an agreement. You will recall what the agreement was. John F. Kennedy said, I will give a pledge that Cuba will never be invaded by US forces. In return, I want Khrushchev to state that the missile systems will come out of Cuba within the next three weeks. That was the very clear crisis management dialogue. And the only other element when you go back and look at all of this that remained an open question in that discussion between Robert Kennedy and the USSR ambassador was would Kennedy also take out the nuclear forces, the Jupiter forces, that were positioned in Turkey because Khrushchev had sent him a letter saying, I want these out. And John F. Kennedy had said, yes, they will come out, but I cannot say this in public. There will be no quid pro quo. I will not be leveraged on this issue of Jupiter missiles. Why am I saying all of this? Robert Kennedy wrote a very important book. I refer you to it, 13 Days memoirs of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Robert Kennedy encapsulated in that book five lessons learned, and I'm going to build on those five lessons learned in terms of what we've learned since. Robert Kennedy in 13 days learned five things. It's a fascinating book written very politically, heavily edited back in 1967. First, you gather intelligence reconnaissance, which the U.S. did over Cuba. Second, you work as diligently as you can your diplomatic contacts. For those of you who don't recall, the United States was very successful. The Organization of American States gave a very positive endorsement of what the United States was doing in Cuba. Third, you seek U.N. resolutions, even if you know you cannot get them. It was very clear that USSR was going to block any resolution. But nevertheless, Kennedy and his team spent a lot of time trying to get a resolution. Fourth, muscularly, you sanction and you impose a blockade. And you will all recall the pictures of the blockade around the Cuban island. Most importantly, you bolster a strong deterrence posture. And you will recall again, the United States moved massive numbers of army and air force assets south 
to show that they were serious if the crisis could not be resolved any other way. In the next few minutes, I will add what I think we have learned through Afghanistan for the last 13 years. I think that this is the way forward. I see the way forward as very positive uh, because this triad, I think we have embedded it in our psyches now. And I think that the next time a crisis comes, we will have a very firm, comprehensive approach of where we should be going. Um, first and foremost, Kennedy did not need to concern himself with development aid in Cuba. We must ever more for the future be working on the assumption that there can be no stability in a country we would try to assist through military means only. There must be a development aid constituent element. This is something that the military through the PRT process in Afghanistan have driven forward with great or lesser success. It depends on the PRT, it depends on the province, it depends on the historical perspective you take vis-a-vis -vis what's happened in Afghanistan. Second, we have learned to our own chagrin that there is an element of transnational crime in most areas we will be going to in terms of deployed military uh, activities. Something that, of course, Kennedy did not have to concern himself with. And today, it is just as key that we understand one of the reasons for our long protracted war in Afghanistan has been the fact transnational crime was very much present there. It has fueled the Taliban. Today, the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, reports that there is just as much opium being produced in the fields of Afghanistan as when we arrived there in 2001. There are many treaties that could be treatises that could be written about this failure to really take seriously the transnational crime aspect of the illicit trafficking. We must do better in the future. That is something I put on the table for discussion. We have learned to work with the European Union in a synergy fashion. We would have liked the European Union to do more in terms of police sector reform. They have assisted, but to a lesser extent, I think, than most of the international community would have liked to see arise. In the future, there will not be any Canadian deployment, I would hazard, without a strong EU force also. I think that this is the area where NATO and the EU are drawing conclusions. It was one of the communique statements coming out of the Chicago summit. We need to work and to foster this relationship. The World Bank has attended two now of the most recent NATO summits. And interestingly enough, this is very interesting, they do not talk anymore about the economic problems of Afghanistan. They talk about the crisis management aspects of Afghanistan. They have taken on our language about what has gone on in this country. And therefore, I think the learning relationship with the World Bank has been one of the features of lessons learned. The Secretary General of NATO five weeks ago announced the creation of a senior representative post, a female diplomat, who would be responsible vis-a-vis -vis the international community to explain what NATO is doing vis-a-vis -vis United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, entitled Women, Peace and Security. This has been a long time coming, but we welcome this at NATO headquarters, and we believe this will be a very good sign for the future. What is this, you may ask? 1325 puts emphasis on three elements related to women in conflict. First, that we must ensure that women are part of the reconciliation, reintegration, and dialogue process without which there will never be a political conclusion to any conflict. And that women bring skills, they bring reflexes, they bring intuition, which we need to draw on to create a space to stop the fighting. 
Second, we must ensure that our forces as they deploy are sensitive to the role of women in a society such as Afghanistan, where education has not been granted to them, where they live in a role within the society, very much unlike Canada, and where they have also been subject to sexual violence, both in conflict and out of conflict. Third, we need to make sure that in our development work, we leave behind a legacy for women. We leave behind a legacy where the country is stronger in terms of human rights and women's rights than when we went in. We are looking at a longer time horizon and uh, Prime Minister Harper, when he came to the Chicago summit in May this year, stated that Canada is in Afghanistan for the long haul too. We are now talking about 2025 in terms of an enduring partnership with Afghanistan. Robert Kennedy's 13 days book looks extremely anachronistic when one looks at the complexity of crisis management today. Media and strategic communications, the 24 seven world has required us to pick up our game in, ter in terms of telling what our story is. John F. Kennedy ruled the airwaves, and I invite you to go back and look at the audio files of what he was able to say to a world without television and where radio was only being turned on and off during a certain number of hours. Today, we are all victims of the fact that each and every journalist who deploys to Afghanistan has his or her story about failure in his or her favorite village or corruption in a certain element on the wavelengths faster, more aggressively, than we can bring a broader story about overall improvements. We need to continue to work on police sector reform. This is key. For those of you who do not follow these sad statistics, there are more deaths, more deaths each day of Afghan police forces than there are in the army. This is an area where corruption has hit them very hard and where there are still a lot of reprisals vis-a-vis -vis these young police force members. International courts, we are working within NATO today still on international writs that have been sent to us regarding alleged atrocities in Libya. There will be others in other conflict zones. This is something where we have to be sensitive to the interests of the world community and legitimately where we have to respond transparently to the questions that will be asked. I'd like to close by talking about NGOs, knowing that uh, our panel members have worked with NGOs more than I. I've spent only some months in Afghanistan and certainly not been there years, but the one thing that we have learned over the last 12 years is the importance of talking with NGOs. Médecins Sans Frontières was a very recalcitrant partner. They did not want to talk with NATO initially because there was this space that had to be held between the military and the NGO assistant corps. That is increasingly shrunk and so much the better. Because if our goals are the same, our means are not, but our goals are the same, then it's important that we discuss increasingly with the NGOs with whom you will be working. And last, cultural awareness. The Secretary General has paid a lot of attention to this theme of cultural awareness over the last several months. President Karzai, when he comes to NATO events, is talked with, never talked to, but talked with, in a very robust fashion. And the issues of cultural awareness are no longer what we need to learn about Afghanistan. Many things, their language, their very proud traditions, the fact that they are Islamic culture. We have to learn about that. But in exchange, Afghanistan needs to understand that the aspirations of the Western community trying to help them is only damaged by some of the statements coming out of Kabul. Therefore, there has to be a two-way street here in terms of cultural awareness and understanding as we try to work with them as partners. Let me close on that. 
I will be looking forward to the discussion in the panel. I bring a very clear message of a glass half full. There will be many detractors of the Afghanistan story over the next several months and years. We will leave behind a legacy where the glass will never be full, but I believe we've done a great deal of very positive work. We as Canadians in the international community can be very proud of what we both attempted and what we did in fact achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you.